Good afternoon and welcome to the second day of our Affordable Home Ownership Summit. I'm thrilled to be back as your MC to guide you through our sessions. In today's opening session, we'll hear remarks from the Center CEO, Christy Peel, and kick off day two with an exciting brainstorm activity led by our own Sophia Abbasi, Ari Shivani, and Ivy Perez from the Center's Policy, Research, and Communications team. Attendees, you will see a chat box directly to the right of this live stream video. That's where you can chat with other audience members. There's also a Q&A box to the right, which allows you to submit questions that will be used for brainstorming session, as well as to submit questions to the panel moderators in later sessions for consideration. If you're having technical difficulties, check out our FAQs up top for how to get support or click on the red icon in the lower right corner. With that out the way, Let's get this session started. Thank you. Thank you, Dakari, and good afternoon, all. Welcome to the second day of our ninth annual Affordable Homeownership Summit. My name is Christy Peel, and I have the honor and privilege of serving as the CEO and Executive Director of the Center for New York City Neighborhoods. We are so grateful you have joined us for this annual opportunity to take a deep dive into affordable homeownership in New York. We believe homeownership is an anchor for thriving neighborhoods and should be an achievable dream for all New Yorkers and especially for BIPOC New Yorkers. As we hope you agree after the first day of the summit, we need to continue to build, build out this coalition that is dedicated to affordable, attainable, and sustainable homeownership for working families. We kicked off yesterday with an amazing conversation with Vanessa Perry, who shared her analysis of the interconnected forces that have impeded Black homeownership in the US and how we can break through these barriers together. We also explored what makes New York City's neighborhoods thrive with former city council member Danique Miller and current city council member Sylvina Brooks Powers, and also looked into the challenges and opportunities confronting Queens homeowners in their communities. We'll have a similar wide ranging discussion about Brooklyn neighborhoods today. Each year after the affordable, at the Affordable Homeownership Summit, it's really important for us to take a look back at where we've been and where we're going. And that we includes all of our network partners because so much of our work happens working together in collaboration. Many of you are joining us today and it's because of your deep rooted knowledge of your neighborhoods, your expertise and your innovative thinking, the change is actually possible. I was so inspired by Vanessa's uh, SAFE safe framework uh, for addressing black and brown home ownership uh, that we heard about yesterday, which focuses on four key priorities needed to address the racial home ownership gap. Supply constraints, affordability, fair housing, and environmental sustainability. So when we consider our work to promote and protect affordable home ownership through the safe framework, uh, what progress have we made and what lies ahead? Let's start with supply constraints. We heard loud and clear from, from Vanessa about how the lack of affordable homes across the country has driven prices out of reach for many, many renters who want to buy. But in a city with an unprecedented number of unhoused families and an indisputable affordable rental crisis, is it enough to advocate for much needed, deeply affordable rental units? It is so necessary and absolutely not enough because without intentionally building more new affordable homeownership housing specifically, we will never be able to close the city's racial homeownership gap. In the past, we talked about the impact of cash buyers and predatory investor activity on the limited supply of existing affordable one to four family homes in New York City. And while we do need to make it easier for families to purchase these existing homes, we also simply need many, many more affordable homes. Over the past year, we've made really significant progress in homeownership policy in New York. In New York City, Mayor Adams centered affordable homeownership in his housing blueprints, saying he wants to put, quote, the dream of homeownership back into the grasp of working, uh, working people. We hope to hear more about, his, uh, about this today when HPD Commissioner Adolfo Carrion Jr. joins Colvin Granham in a fireside chat. It's also incredibly exciting that Governor Hochul committed $400 million in capital just for the creation of, of uh, new affordable homeownership units in our state. So the time is now to call for the creation of tens of thousands of new 
multifamily affordable homeownership units, akin to what the city and the state did together uh, in years past with the Mitchell-Lama program. The political will is there, the funding is there, uh, now we just need to make it happen. <laughs> it's not easy, right? We need the right tax incentives, we need developers and construction lenders on board, and we need community leaders to identify sites, but with focus, intentionality, and a broad-based coalition that is dedicated to closing the racial homeownership gap, we can get this done. Vanessa also highlighted affordability as a key priority. So even as we tackle the issue of supply, we must consider how much homeowners, and again, BIPOC homeowners in particular, are struggling with the unaffordability of keeping their homes, which has only become more difficult in the pandemic. We're also incredibly concerned about the impact of a rising interest rate environment and a looming recession on lower income homeowners. That's why we've been laser focused on connecting homeowners to HOP, getting MAP dollars in the hands of New York homeowners in previous years, and today providing financial support to thousands of people through the New York State Homeowner Assistance Fund. So many of you here today are part of this truly monumental effort, be it as a HOP partner, a lender, a government partner, or otherwise. We also continue to assist New York City families with physical repairs through HPD's Home Fix program so they can maintain their properties affordably. It's why we successfully advocated through the Coalition for Affordable Homes for more down payment assistance under, under Home First and have advocated to reform property taxes and the tax lien sale. It's no coincidence uh, that our CDFI, sorry, is actually called Sustainable Neighborhoods. So much of what we do is intended to alleviate the pressures of increasing costs for current homeowners so they have a chance at sustainable homeownership. Vanessa really hit the nail on the head with this one. And we need to talk about fair housing. As we discussed with Vanessa yesterday, it's an, under, it's an understatement uh, to say that the racial wealth gap and discrimination in housing present serious challenges, even 54 years after the passage of the Fair Housing Act of 1968. Systemic racism, redlining, gentrification, and racist practices that still pervade the home selling and home lending ecosystem continue to keep black and brown families from accessing the benefits of home ownership that white families have enjoyed for centuries. And looking at our work together, it's clear that we have programming that is specifically targeted at closing the racial wealth gap and achieving race specific goals. And that focus is so important. This past year, the center has worked with black led organizations, including many here today, to expand the Black Home Ownership Project and launch just this week an estate planning program to protect hard earned intergenerational wealth for Black families, which is called Generation to Generation. And we have a lot more in the works. We developed Underwriting for Good, a digital underwriting system that will give black and brown home buyers more equitable access to mortgage loans. We're working with a consortium of home ownership professionals, including public, private, and nonprofit partners to identify and amplify opportunities for black and brown home ownership in New York City. So stay tuned for an upcoming announcement from our friends at LISC New York and NHS of New York City about this exciting work. The center and our partners are doing the work locally in our communities to address this entrenched problem. But what Vanessa said yesterday and about which we're very much aware is that we're, you know, frankly, making incremental changes within a large current system. Albeit incremental changes that mean so much to the individual families we work with. And what we need to do now is to keep articulating, naming and crafting all of the pieces that are needed to make a new anti-racist system for home buying, home lending and home ownership issues. And this summit, the work we are all doing now is that work. And finally, the last piece of the SAFE framework is environmental resiliency. Surrounding all of these challenges is the climate crisis, which continues to be much more real and tangible in our daily lives. As we mark the 10th anniversary of Hurricane Sandy next week, we're painfully aware of the recovery that lies ahead for families in Puerto Rico and, and in Florida. It reminds us that climate resilience and disaster preparedness must be accessible to all New Yorkers. To that end, we've expanded our work with the Mayor's Office of Climate and Environmental Justice around Flood Help NY, an online resource that informs New York City homeowners how to protect their homes and finances from the impacts of flooding. This year alone, we've seen 50,000 visitors and we've expanded our reach by also creating a printed toolkit in multiple languages for residents without internet service. Through Flood Help NY and with our climate resiliency partners, 
We have worked to educate property owners on both risk rating 2.0, sorry, <laughs> FEMA's new insurance rating standard, and on the impact of stormwater flooding on our inland communities. Communities of color have felt the impact of environmental destruction for decades, and our work around recovery, resiliency, and sustainability must adapt to the needs of homeowners who continue to be at risk. That's what we're doing with NYSERDA and partners as we help with the launch of clean energy hubs across the city. And that's why we're collaborating to explore a parametric recovery grant program for neighborhoods prone to rainfall flooding, which would deliver faster payouts and flexible dollars for impacted families. When we consider our work within the SAFE framework, it's clear we've made so much progress when we work in collaboration and in coordination. Together, we built the Homeowner Protection Program into the largest and most effective statewide foreclosure prevention program in the country. And our collective advocacy brought New York homeowners much needed federal COVID relief. Of course, there is so much more to be done. Uh, and there too, our successes will be through collaboration and partnership. Our network partners know exactly what homeowners needs are, which is why we always wanna elevate your insights, whether here at the summit or through initiatives we launch together. We rely on your knowledge to shine a light on gaps, to call issues out, to say this isn't right, to identify systemic issues and to call for systemic solutions. Our collaborations have resulted in important work that leads to increased attention, action by government, resources and real help for homeowners. So I'll be turning the mic over soon to our incredible team here at the center to lead us all in an inspiring blue sky visioning session but I first wanna give our lead sponsor, Wells Fargo, a special thanks for their support. We are also so grateful for incredible support from City, Mr. Cooper, along with Dime Bank, NeighborWorks, Street Easy, the Federal Home Loan Bank of New York, and additional support from Goldman Sachs, BTQ Financial, HSBC, and Enterprise. Next year will be the 10th anniversary of this summit. We're working hard to bring us back together in person for some true celebration, and we'll be in touch as we plan that event. And now I'll hand it off to Sophia Abbasi, Ari Shirvani, and Ivy Perez to lead us in a short exercise to bring your collective brain power together to envision what we need for thriving neighborhoods. Thank you so much, Christy. Hi, everyone. I'm Sophia Abbasi. I'm the communications manager here at the center. I'm joined by my colleagues, Ivy Perez, senior policy and research manager, and Ariana Shirvani, senior policy and research associate. Affordable home ownership can't exist in a vacuum. That much is clear from the first day of conversations we've been having on resiliency, credit, and the policy environment needed for affordable home ownership. So in this session, we'd like to invite you all to brainstorm on the building blocks of thriving neighborhoods. Let's go ahead on our screen share. We all know that diverse neighborhoods are what New York City is all about, but many New Yorkers and families continue to struggle with rising costs, inflation, unequal access to health care, crumbling infrastructure, transportation, and the threat of climate change that impacts our built environment and its residents. We want to think of a collective vision that helps create pathways to affordable home ownership, and we want to hear from you. Tell us what makes New York City neighborhoods thrive. Using one of these stickies here, grab one and identify actions, policies, initiatives, theories, and any ideas that you think would make neighborhoods thrive in order to promote affordable home ownership. Categorize them in the local, state, and federal level that you think needs to be achieved in order to bring affordable home ownership to a reality in some of our neighborhoods. We'll have seven minutes to kick off the session. What a good group to think to. It looks like there's a big, good turnout today from the chat. Let's see what we got going on. Two bold participants already out there. Weatherizing homes. Um, that's the first sticky that I see. 
Um, and yeah, that's a very important local initiative. Although I have to say that um, funding and support from the federal government is also really important. Let's see what we have removing obstacles for local homeowners to create housing through ADUs, basement apartments, et cetera. Yeah, and this is an interesting one because here there's a lot of overlap between local and state that needs the two entities need to work together to allow this type of ADU um, legalization. And it's um it's a cause that's um very important to us here at the center. Um, we have been advocating for the legalization of safe basement apartments for a while. Um, our One of our panelists yesterday was talking about the need for more infrastructure development um, before we have um, ADU legalization. Um, but I think that uh, we need both very, very soon. We really need a pathway to safe legal apartments now. No, we cannot keep up with you. <laughs> I know there's so many community <laughs> land trusts. I see community Obviously, land trusts in there, yeah. That. Yes. I think it's great that the person put three stars as well. <laughs> we got to engage. Yeah, I don't know if you want to say in the chat um, what, if those are asterisks or just stars because CLTs are stars. <laughs> uh, Good point. Ooh, I love this one at the federal level where we don't have as many support for more varied housing types through Fannie, Freddie, and other funding products. Um, I do think that um, Fannie is on the topic of CLTs. I think that they're developing um, mortgage products specifically for CLTs, um, but definitely more of that um, is needed. Um, something else I'm seeing on the federal level is nationwide flood insurance program, another cause very important for folks here at the center and a lot of our partners. Um, and something that we know is that that's obviously a federal program, but there needs to be a lot of state and local support um, because one of the biggest pain points is outreach for homeowners, um, making sure that homeowners uh, know what they need to know um, to be protected. This trains in all caps is uh, provocative, loving it. And so this is something that could happen also between the federal and the local level, right? Yes, absolutely. And something that is would really be necessary as part of a movement here in New York City is whenever there is development like trains, whenever there's um, infrastructure development, again, community engagement and buy-in for the community is really important. And also making sure that we have anti-displacement mechanisms um, so that when improvements come to the, to the community, the existing residents actually are able to stay there. And enjoy these new improvements, right? Yes, yes. more walkability, less cars. The cease and desist um, is a great one too, because there, this is a, a movement that's expanding within the city, right? Yeah, yeah, there have been more hearings. Um, uh, there was a legislation passed last year to expand um, cease and desist zones. So I think there have been um, a number of hearings um, that the Department of State has put on. Um, and I would say that that's, that's a local and state issue because um, the two absolutely need to work in conjunction together. So sorry to who put that there, I'm moving your sticky. <laughs> you know, it's sometimes hard to navigate. So maybe that person was aiming for both, you know? I, so, I'm loving these hearts. So. <laughs> Yes, support for BIPOC homeowners. I'm seeing down payment assistant and first time home buyers programs have the hearts and um, I feel that way too. Um, we are working at the center on a down payment assistance navigator that'll make it even easier for folks to um, uh, figure out what kind of down payment assistant they're eligible for. And um, as Alfonso Carrion might discuss later today, the city also increased the amount that they have available for first time home buyers um, that can achieve that the amount that they can access. Um, it, I think now it's up to $100,000 in down payment assistance for first time home buyers.
I'm also seeing rethinking of credit and lending guidelines. Um, that's really interesting. Obviously, we've also been doing work on increasing access to credit here at the center, as was discussed in yesterday's panel, um, but definitely more needs to be done um, top down. So we're really hoping that our underwriting for good initiative um, gets more support and that we can um, provide proof of concept for alternative um, data and alternative ways to demonstrate ability to pay. We have uh, less than a minute left, so get your stickies in before we get to the next session. Supports for various types of limited equity co-ops. I'm going to zoom in to see that other sticky. Invest oh, investment. Oh, oh yeah. I was going to read it out loud for you. Investment in the entire fabric of community that includes education, infrastructure, green space, businesses, etc. I love that. One. I yeah. love it. Love that one. And um, that uh, there's also another protecting small businesses um, sticky. It's not something that we talk about as often um, at the center, but it's something that we know. Um, is as crucial a part of um, thriving neighborhoods as supporting homeowners. Absolutely, absolutely. And maybe that's something we can do more research on because um, local economies make homeownership more desirable as well. Thank you all so much for contributing to that part of the session. Um, we'll head over to uh, our final part of this session where we'll look specifically at um, each borough. So each borough has its own unique qualities and characteristics that really define its neighborhoods, but it also has its own set of needs. Um, so what do you think your borough needs in order to promote affordable home ownership opportunities for its community? And we'll get started with another seven minutes for this session. I see some of you have already gotten started. Rent is too high. <laughs> uh, I know that's definitely true in Brooklyn. It's true in all of the boroughs at this point. I think, yeah, that <laughs> might be a universal truth. Yes. Oh, I'm seeing repair programs for senior homeowners. That is really, really important. Um, uh, something that we've been keeping our eye on at the center is that so many of the city's homeowners are actually senior homeowners. A third of the city's homeowners are senior homeowners. And I don't actually know the percentage, but I know that um, a lot of the homes in lower rise neighborhoods are also um, quite old. Um, there's a lot of homes in the city that were built before 1960. Um, so increasingly we need um, more um, repair programs. Um, for those homeowners. And that those repair programs can also be to help people from a sustainability standpoint as climate change becomes more and more entrenched in our everyday lives, right? Yes, yes. Um, home repairs and uh, weatherization, which we saw um, a sticky for in the previous moment, in the previous um, section, um, uh, they, they really go together because sometimes you can't really make the weatherization improvements without addressing other needs that the home has. Interesting. I see somebody in the Bronx wants to get rid of all of the highways. I don't disagree with that. I thought as that post it was coming together that it was going to be not just Bronx related, but get rid of all the rats. <laughs> <laughs> But this person kept it on, on topic. I'm loving this condo and co-op transparency, right? Yes. Something that we, um, in our research again, have seen is that some of the, the homes that remain somewhat affordable in New York City are primarily in co-ops. Co-ops um, are the biggest share, really, 
of, of homes that are available under $500,000 in the city. Um, so that in theory should improve access for a lot of um, low and moderate income home buyers to be able to access, but there is so little transparency around co-op applications that um, that in itself is a barrier um, to accessing those homes. There was legislation introduced at the state level last year that would help to move us towards co-op and condo transparency, including um, it would have entailed co-op boards disclosing why um, applicants were denied. So that would be great. Yeah. And I see that um, they're pointing at Manhattan and Queens. Um, yes. for co-op transparency, which makes sense because there are a lot of co-op buildings um, in those two boroughs. I'm gonna go to Staten Island and see what's going on over there. Absolutely. I'm loving preserving diverse communities. And there are yeah. many ways to tackle that, right? Anti-displacement, as I was saying before, I think is, is a really important key, especially as new amenities come to a neighborhood. Um, really the, the number one priority should be to help as many residents stay in that neighborhood as possible. And of course, home ownership is a great um, way to um, help families um, have more stable housing. Rezoning for denser housing close to transit. That makes sense. Um, again, with anti-displacement mechanisms. Um, and I want to quickly call out the, the flood assistance um, in Brooklyn. Um, we were talking during the Queens spotlight um, yesterday um, that in addition to coastal flooding, there's also obviously an increasing need um, or an increasing danger rather of inland flooding um, from, right. from stormwater. Y'all are kind of quiet in the chat. I was expecting more of a, I don't know, a dialogue. Ooh, I, 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 yeah, sorry to interrupt, Ari, but I just saw language and other supports for immigrant homeowners. Um, that's very, very important. There are a lot of immigrant homeowners in New York City. Um, and while there's also a lot of services for homeowners in New York City, the language barrier um, can sometimes be a barrier. Um, so definitely um, support translating as many documents and um, having them available in as many languages as possible. Why is there a tax and sale? Good question. I want to say, luckily, there hasn't been legislation passed that has um, enabled a tax and sale for this year. So let's hope that that doesn't come together anytime soon. Yes, so the city doesn't currently have authorization for a tax lien sale. We hope it stays that way. Um, that's a great protection that these communities have had. Um, and we hope it, it stays the, that way. I do have some commentary. So one of the problems with renting with a co-op is that the leases are generally limited to two years. Also, the application fees for applying a rent to, for a rental unit in co-ops are very high. That's some good nuance. Looks like we have about 30 seconds left for this activity. For the more homeownership opportunities, I cannot help but think about COPA and TOPA. What do you think about that? Yes. Good call. Yes, we haven't mentioned um, TOPA and COPA at all. We would be TOPA. remiss as policy people. <laughs> so TOPA is the state initiative. COPA is the city initiative. Um, they're uh, for um, tenant or community opportunity to purchase act, um, exciting legislation. Um, just as time's up, um, that enables tenants to um, have an opportunity to buy um, the buildings that they live in when they go for sale, giving them more um, power um, and say over their housing. So that's exciting to see. And thank you so much for all of your stickies, everyone. Yes.
Thank you all for sharing your thoughts and ideas. This board looks amazing. Um, these kinds of generative conversations are so important to have. So we're really grateful for bringing everybody together, having this board um, and having this conversation about what our neighborhoods, boroughs, and our city really needs. Thank you all so much. Now back to you, Takari. Thank you. And thank you, Christy, for framing the summit so aptly. Both what we heard yesterday and what's to come today. And a, just a big shout out to Sophia, Ari, and Ivy for leading an engaging and stimulating brainstorm. I definitely feel mentally warmed up, and I hope we're all excited to dive into day two. Now it's time to head back to the main agenda page and click on the link for our first panel of the day, Burl Spotlight, Brooklyn. It starts at 1.40, so if you got a small break, hydrate, stretch, and we'll see you there. <laughs>